Hello, your host, Darkness, here. A quick note about tonight's episode. You'll find it wildly contradicts Sammy the Bull's narrative on his podcast, and that's because Sammy got a lot of his facts wrong. Sammy acknowledges he had nothing to do with the Epilito hit. He was mostly just repeating hearsay. His business with Roy was very limited because he didn't trust nor want anything to do with Roy. He thought he was crazy. He was a little afraid of him in the self-preservation sense, not because he was a coward. And it's suspected by law enforcement their business was limited to receiving drug imports they could sell. Sammy won't admit that he dealt drugs prior to the ecstasy ring, but yeah, he did. My book will cover Roy's drug smuggling operation a little bit more, but I'll give you a bit of it here, just a tiny bit. Now, I'm going to give you the first time that, and the only time that I'm aware of, that the Mafia cops met Roy. And this comes from Dominic Montiglio. I don't think this has ever been released, though. He told this to Frank Pergola when they were sitting together. Louis knew who Roy was very well. Now, let's begin. It's almost midnight, November 1978. Chris Rosenberg's still alive. Danny Grillo is deteriorating, but still alive for at least a few more days. Dozens of guys are walking around at dock in Queens. There's plenty of lighting, but it's black in a circle basically all around that. The ocean is black. You can hear it lapping. On top of all that black, vans concealed in the shadows are parked with their back doors open. Men are hauling plastic bags and burlap sacks full of loots and tons of marijuana, and they're placing them in the back of these vans. New York's going to be high as shit this month because of these guys. It's not bad work, at least for drug smugglers. There's an entire table laid out in the cold with macaroni salad, cold cuts, gotta make myself hungry, and even pickled pig's feet for whatever sick fuck eats those. There's also steaming coffee. And all of this is at the courtesy of the Mafia. About 
half the guys present are sailors, maybe a third at least. And these sailors, well, they're from Hollywood, Florida. And they've just spent about 11 days at sea coming back from, from Columbia Village in the middle of fucking nowhere off the coast. Uh, and that village is mostly drug dealers. We're talking really poor. I don't even know if they live there most of the time. And then it's off, days at sea, going up the East Coast, dodging the Coast Guard, and then they arrive. Now, this trawler that's arrived, it's renamed Terry's Dream. Its old name was Darlene. And it's at the harbor. It's just been pulled in and navigated. And it's tied up, you know, moored. So who are the rest of the guys who are hauling this stuff? Besides the sailors. Well, some of them are known guys from Roy's crew. I think Richie is one of them. Uh, some of them are Lucchese. And some of them work for the Chin. Now, Terry's Dream is only one of four shrimp boats. You know, there was one originally that was lost at sea. There were originally five uh, that are used to smuggle drugs. So these guys are making millions. These guys invest into it a piece. Some, a lot of millions. And... Roy, this and his auto theft operation are his two cash cows. So the operation, its investors, of course, include Roy DeMeo, Vincent the Chin Gigante, probably Sammy the Bull, though he would deny it, and a host of other unsavory characters. And it was all started by the short and sinister Anthony Casso Gaspipe. Gaspipe is, of course, a nickname that came from his dad, uh, who used to hit people with a gas pipe. I believe he was a longshoreman. And uh, that nickname carried on. So Casso's masterminded one of the biggest drug smuggling operations in New York City history. Vic Amuso was also obviously invested in this, but Casso's the mastermind. And he's one of the most evil men in La Cosa Nostra history. Cosa Nostra, whichever you prefer. Obviously history that's filled with all sorts of odious figures, including, obviously, Roy DeMeo, whose cold-heartedness rivals gas pipes. So, in what way do they compare? Well, Roy, he kills more often. He loves killing more often. And he'll kill you as soon as he looks at you. So what could possibly be worse than that? Well, at least he's loyal to his friends. He took care of Freddy's ex, Peggy, when she needed him. Um... Without any asking anything back, uh, he once offered to buy one of his neighbor's new car after his was stolen. Insurance paid for it. Uh, so Roy has that strange good side to him that just, you know, turns over to hide. And then there's Casso. Well, he doesn't seem to have much redeemable quality, at least as far as his ethics go. He's just greedy and treacherous, and he'll fuck over anybody you know, if he needs to, or if he feels as if it in some way advances him. Pete LaFrosha, who worked for him uh, in a drug smuggling operation after Roy, he said that he that uh, gas pipe turned into a crackhead. I can't substantiate that, obviously. That's what LaFrosha says. Wouldn't surprise me, though, concluding, uh, considering his behavior. So, will Roy kills more often, gas pipe, sometimes tortures, and Roy, he kills you immediately, because it's not about the suffering part. And gas pipe's also less methodical, so the pain is more often palpable when he hasn't fully killed you, as you're going to see in a second. But either way, they're both great at business, and the two of them have been making millions dealing drugs for years now, even though Neither of them like or trust each other, and they're both psychopaths. That night, Casso's not there. He's never there. He always stays in a boat nearby when he's anywhere uh, that's not home, and he's got his little walkie-talkie, and then he's going to eventually go and tell the chin. Roy might have been. Roy is more of a hands-on guy, but Casso is not. And, of course, Paul Castellano knows none of this. He'd be pissed at everybody if he knew about it. Obviously, he's not going to try to do anything against the Chin or Casso and their different families. But Roy and Nino, who is also making money off this, he's never there, but he's making money, they would be whacked if any of this was found out. Everything's been go going smoothly for the past five years, sailing in to uh, Jamaica Bay. And then that night, everything went to shit. 
Some guys, nobody knows who the fuck these guys are, run to the Coast Guard and snitch. Then somebody else went to the mob guys and told them. Well, as soon as they're told, the smugglers leap into their cars and jettison off. And they leave everything. The vans, they, they still have, they're still open with all this marijuana inside, quaaludes and bags. Uh, the coffee's still hot. Uh, the partially eaten food. And then inside the shrimp boat, somebody's also shipping cocaine because there's a book opened that's on cocaine dealing. I don't know where you find that. Well, you could say the DeMeo crew, Casso, and the Chins guys got lucky because moments later, the authorities arrived. They've got their guns out, looking at all this, and that's true. They did get lucky for a moment because people snitch. Lots of rats. And a lot of rats are about to snitch. Because club guys, oh, they don't really have any reason not to. They don't even know who Boy DeMeo and the Chen and Castle are, but they know who guys are who know who they are. Oh, now this is a problem. So people are snitching. Now, Roy has an important DeMeo crew member, Richard Masterangelo. He's not mentioned in Murder Machine, but he is a crew member. He sells stolen cars, and he's, you know, helping oversee and operate this operation as one of the guys who actually does something that's not in the boat itself and not doing the heavy lifting. Now, Master Angelo buys these boats that bring in, you know, Terry's Dream and the shrimp boats, help navigate them in so they don't wreck. And... And the feds managed to find the boat that brought in Terry's dream. Well, it's right there, let's face it. And she can trace it back to this guy, Bennett, who sold it to Master Angelo. Bennett, he doesn't want to be a part of this shit. So he snitches on Master Angelo, and he doesn't just snitch. He agrees to be wiretapped. Okay, so now Master Angelo comes to him. He's like, hey, don't snitch, don't snitch. And it's on wire. So even though Master Angelo won't flip, he's very, very much a loyal criminal. Uh, he's very loyal to Roy and so forth. He's now in handcuffs, arrested, and Roy has an obligation to try to get him out of this. And as far as everybody else goes, well, there's still other people out there who might snitch. And What's the problem with working for guys like the Chin, Roy DeMeo, and Gaspipe if they don't even really know much about you or care about you? Or yeah, even working for Frank Lasterino, who's also a ruthless guy who worked for Gaspipe as his personal hitman and emissary. Uh, and very ruthless guy, too. He looks kind of like somebody who should be singing as a well, Hollywood star like Frank Sinatra, but he's not a singer. He's a killer. The problem, now there's going to be a bloodbath because uh, they don't know if they're going to snitch or not. Uh, not all of them have snitched yet, but who cares? I mean, they don't care about these people. They're going to kill you whether you snitch or not. It's this myth that the mob only kills snitches. I want you to kill this fucking Benet, Gaspipe tells DeMeo. Now, Gaspipe doesn't have any authority over Roy, and Roy's not afraid of them. They have mutual respect for each other, and this Benet is connected to his boat. Besides, Roy likes killing people. I'll be happy to whack that rat. Meanwhile, Gaspipe and a few of his men, they fly down to Hollywood, Florida, and they show up, invite the ship captain over, who's there at the time he's fled down there. Uh, I don't think he's ratted, but fuck that. Just whack him anyway, just to make sure. And so... They shoot him in a bar, drag him out. They find his son, shoot him, drag him out, put him in the trunks. They drive over to a swamp, take him out, drag him over to the swampland marsh, and they begin burying them. Nighttime, Casso's there with his shovel doing it hands-on. He's got a couple guys with him. Suddenly a trembling hand reaches up, and the body starts to sit up of the captain's son. He's shuffling, groaning. What the fuck? Gaspipe and the other guys are staring down in horror under the moonlight. 
No, I just didn't kill him. Gas pipe sighs. No problem. He lifts his shovel up, hits the bleeding, moaning man in the head, splitting his skull. He's either dead or at least dying. Gas pipe doesn't care which as long as he's dead by the time he leaves. And he continues to shovel him, possibly burying him alive. As far as everybody else goes, there's still a problem. A lot of the rats, people who've definitely ratted, they're now in custody. And the mob's having trouble getting at them. And one of the main guys the mob's having trouble getting at is Bennett. So it's a year later after Terry's dream. Roy and the others just can't get to the rest that are in custody, including this fucking Bennett. Master Angelo, who looks like Al Pacino, kind of, I don't think that much, but that's how he's described by the media when he's brought in. He's sitting in a jail cell. Trial won't be till the early 80s. But Roy's worried that this is all going to get back to him. Fucking rats everywhere. Kenny McCabe and Nelson are also watching him whenever he leaves the Veterans and Friends and the Gemini Lounge. They now know all kinds of terrible things about him, though, though not the full extent of Roy's depravity yet. And Roy's grieving badly because Chris is dead. Roy's starting to feel weak. Even if he's trying not to show it, he's starting to feel really weak. Weak for the first time since the IRS were giving him a hard time. You're not supposed to show weakness in his position, but people are noticing it. And Nino Gaggi, he one day tells Dominic, I don't know if Roy's going to hold up if the authorities catch him. Meanwhile, Roy, well, he can't see a shrink. So what's the solution? Eat. 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 Take Valium. Work out. And he's starting to get an enormous belly. And they know that he's nervous. And Roy's also starting to drink more and more and more. He's drinking all the time now. Full-fledged alcoholic. Guzzling away. It's actually making Vito Arena nervous. I don't want to work for an alcoholic. And he complains to Roy. Roy gets furious and shuts him the fuck up. And so Vito's quiet about it, but nervous. Along with nervous because... The whole crew now, including Freddy, not Henry. Henry's being nice to him still, but Freddy are all calling him a fat fag. In the meantime, Roy still has his responsibilities. He can't give up. He wants to be the greatest mob boss ever, even if that's pretty much impossible for him to ever be a mob boss at this point. Now that Chris was dead, Roy needed a new second in command. There were two good choices. Henry Brelli and Joey Testa. Henry Brelli had seniority. He had been with the crew the longest and was seven years older than Joey. Obviously, he was capable. Both of them were intelligent in terms of making money and murder. Henry was closer to Dominic, and Roy was always interested in staying on Nino's good side. However, there are several additional factors to take into consideration. Joey was the most ambitious and serious when it came to work. He didn't show up late like Henry did. He had a goal. Joey wanted to be made in La Cosa Nostra someday. When Joey was a kid, both he and Anthony nearly beat a Puerto Rican to death for hurting a local. Joey's position? Be loyal to your neighborhood, especially the guys who are family and friends. Everyone else is expendable. Of course, some values go through fluctuations in life, but this was his attitude and he had it installed pretty early on. It was an old-fashioned attitude from an era when the Joey types were becoming rare. Finally, because of his mom's sudden death and little parental guidance, Joey had a lot of anger in him. A lot of anger, mixed with vanity. Roy would have noticed this about Joey. Anger and vanity? Well, that can be a useful and deadly combination. Now it's time to turn our attention across the ocean to the small nation of Kuwait. Life was going great in Kuwait. Women were attending college in higher numbers. The British relationship with the Kuwaitis had overall been positive. The Brits had kept Iraq and Saudi Arabia from annexing the small, vulnerable port country where oil was plentiful, and like Westerners, or pretty much people anywhere in the world, who doesn't want nice cars? Especially if you don't have to worry about spending much money on gas, no matter how much you drive. Two men from Kuwait flew to New York on a business trip, Khalid Dowd and Abdul Hussan. They were partners in a freight forward company. The pair had come in search of suppliers who could sell them large numbers of used cars for resale in their own home country. 
Repair wanted quality cars, both popular models back in their country and seats that weren't leather since many of their customers were Muslim who objected to leather seating. Now, while both Khalid and Abdul Hassan wanted to make money, they were otherwise very different in their moral values. Khalid was an honest man, somebody who believed in doing things the right way, that is, without needlessly hurting other people. However, Hassan was an opportunist who would make money however he could, and if somebody got hurt while well, he did business, so be it, so long as the money was right. In America, the pair met with Ronnie Eustica Sr., a Long Island used car dealer. Eustica was a slender and odd-looking man with a long, thick neck and small cheeks and small lips that made him resemble a fish whenever he raised his chin. Outwardly, Ronnie was calm and unimposing. However, underneath, he was an unethical, ruthless, and calculating man, though not the sort himself to get his hands dirty. No, he didn't want to take any direct risks to himself. Instead, he was the type to get others to hurt you for him. So when used to come met fellow auto dealer Roy DeMeo, he went from somebody who was just another unscrupulous car salesman to somebody who was suddenly very dangerous. Eustica told Dowd and Hussan at a business meeting that he could give them the quality used cars of the kind they wanted if they didn't mind that the cars were stolen. Hmm, that's fine with Hussan. Done. However, Khalid was appalled. No, he wasn't interested in breaking law and stealing from people, no matter how lucrative it was. Khalid and Hussan had a fight split up. Hussan agreed to buy and transport the Gemini crew's stolen cars to Kuwait at $5,000 apiece. Kuwait was going to be their largest buyer. To smooth things over with Henry, he was automatically made one of the six investors in Roy's new Kuwait operation. And Henry was also put in charge. Richie and Freddie, well, they were also made investors since they were two of Roy's car specialists. Eustica and Roy themselves, of course, were invested. They were the ringleaders, after all. And finally, Nino would get his cut. Nino would give old big Paul Waterhead his cut. Now, these are the blueprints of Roy and Eustica's scheme. Richie and Vito would scout neighborhoods, and they'd often look in Orthodox Jewish ones, like Burl Park, because like Muslims, the Jewish Orthodox were less likely to have leather seats. Vito was probably doing the driving, since Richie would leap out and hasten over to one of the types of cars the Kuwaitis had a high demand for. And these were usually Chevrolet Caprices, Oldsmobile Regency Buick Electras. Those were the popular brands. Caprices had four doors a lot of times, and these were in demand because they could be used as taxis over in Kuwait. Richie would usually pick the locks, leap in, quickly hotwire the car, and screech away. Richie would then drive to a street near Freddy's shop, Park, flip up the sun visor, it was a method that they were using, and that marked it as stolen. Then he and Vito would repeat this method three times, until there were four stolen cars parked near Freddy's shop at night. Richie would then end the night by riding with Vito over to a payphone, and calling Freddy's shop to say in coded language, there's four in the bush, before hanging up. The next day, Henry and Freddy would drive to work. They'd walk around, see the stolen park cars with the visors up so that they knew which ones were the stolen ones, where they would be fitted with new license plates, VIN numbers, locks, and so forth. Once the stolen cars were ready, Vito Arena's boy toy lover Joey Lee and Dracula, and they were two of the more dim-witted members of the crew, but it's easy not to screw up this task, were paid $200 per car to drive the cars over to Baldwin, Long Island, where Eustica's auto shop was located. There they'd place the car on a car carrier, four at a time by the time they did this, and drove them over to Newark, New Jersey, where Pier 292 is located. From there, there they'd be placed on a ship and sailed to Al Shubaya, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, a port town in Kuwait where Hussan would be waiting with his men. And the scheme worked really well. This turned into the biggest auto theft operation in New York in American history. Dowd was curious why there weren't many Buick Electras available which he could legally purchase at auctions and ship back to Kuwait, like he had planned to. He was an intelligent and tenacious man, and went to investigate Pier 292. Aha! 
there were a large number of them leaking out of New York City. When he went to check the VIN numbers on these Buick Electras and make some phone calls, he figured out, hey, they were stolen. Dowd was not only cheated out of legal business here in the U.S., he didn't like thieves. Unfortunately, Eustica happened to pull up and noticed Dowd writing down the VIN numbers and plate numbers, and Dowd had no idea how dangerous the situation was that he was in. He was about to piss off a platoon of serial killers, ravenous for any reason they could to rationalize murder. Talk about somebody trying to do the right thing and having horrific luck. Dowd proceeded to furiously argue with Eustica. He was a stubborn, firm, and plain-spoken man. He was dismayed and furious. And Eustica was dismayed and furious himself. How dare this man challenge his right to steal from law-abiding citizens? At least in Eustica's morally defective mind. Eustica contacted Roy and the other investors, and they held an emergency meeting. After Eustica told him about Dowd, Roy's eyes gleamed, and his response was predictable. Then we're going to have to kill him. Huh, who would have predicted that solution, Roy? Eustica, pleased that he's now got a little bit of power, said, He's got to go and I'll pay for it. Well, Eustica had learned that Dowd was staying at the Diplomat Hotel, which wasn't far from the Gemini, or Richie for that matter. Now, when Roy and Vito showed up, they uh, realized that Roy had forgotten his silencer. Now, this is during a period when Roy is psychologically deteriorating. He's got a lot going on, more of which I'm going to cover in a second. Four guys walking in and shooting that guy? That's going to be noisy, Vito said. They're waiting there in the car. Uh, Roy goes to the payphone and he calls Richie. Now, Richie had been given a silencer from Roy so that he could join in on the killing fun. So Richie did what he was told. Now, Capici thinks Richie was just an idiot. I think that it's a little bit more of Richie wasn't killing material. It's very easy to make mistakes if you're not cold-blooded about it, because you realize you're about to kill somebody. Richie began anxiously fixing the silencer to a gun. He knew this was murder. He knew this guy was planning to kill Dowd. He was an honest man who wouldn't be considered street trash to the cops like most of the other victims. And Richie, he was not killer material. He wasn't as aggressive as Roy or even Freddy. So suddenly, he makes a mistake and the gun goes off. Ah! With a spray of blood, the bullet discharges in his left hand. They have to call an ambulance. Well, when the crew finds out, Roy aborts the matter. And then he becomes distracted because more problems are showing up. He's not done with Dowd, but Dowd's going to have to wait. Nino and Roy had begun quarreling with another capo for some time now, and they were fighting for their life. It was started with a 34-year-old narcissist named Jimmy Eppolito Jr. that nobody really liked. Think an Italian and Mafia version of Prince Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Jr. had been spoiled by his dad, 64-year-old Jimmy Eppolito Sr., also known as Jimmy the Clan, since he was a little kid. Jr. was obnoxious sometimes refused to pay his debts and bully people because everybody knew his dad was a capo. Now, Senior, don't get me wrong, was a much nicer guy, but when it came to defending his family, no matter what they did wrong, he would defend them. And that's a recipe for raising narcissists and psychopaths, according to research. Senior, though, was otherwise grandfatherly and would pay the debts back for his son and was polite, even to the police. Late 1979, Junior was dealing weapons and drugs with Roy's crew. A dispute happened. The details are vague, though I have court records waiting for me that are supposed to provide more information. But in any event, Roy and some of his crew basically said, fuck this guy, and took the merchandise and the money and didn't give this Junior anything. Junior went to his dad, da, Senior, who went over to Paul's mansion in a huff. By this time, Nino was probably Paul's third favorite Gambino after Bellotti because Nino was spending so much time in Florida and they weren't as close as they used to be. And Roy, at this time, was often acting capo. Even though Paulie detested Roy more than ever and would have probably had Roy whacked by now if it wasn't for Nino, he respected Nino. You know, Nino and Paul were closer. When Jim the Clam settled down with Paul and Bellotti, the White House, Paul's place, remember, he accused Roy and Nino of dealing drugs. Uh oh, that was capital punishment. So then Senior basically said, so can I have these guys whacked? They're violating the rules and for ripping off my son. Paul frowned. 
No, maybe later, but uh, he had no intention, I don't think, of taking up for this guy over Nino. Called Nino and Roy in. The pair then accused Junior of being a snitch, and Paul was also reminded that that idiot Junior violated Cosa Nostra rules recently by associating with the president's family, that is, the president of the United States. Recently, Junior had been working with another underhanded guy, it's not really important who, and they had started this huge charity for orphans all over the world that they could skim off the top. These were guys who literally would steal from a baby. In the process of doing so, they invited big names like Ted Kennedy and Rosalind Carter, First Lady, to come in and donate to this and promote this. And the idea is, is that Jimmy the Clam thought that by having these powerful people close to him, that will make him more powerful. I mean, who's going to screw with a guy who's really close to the president's wife? You do that, they're going to come down on you. It's pretty stupid myopic, though. And I want to emphasize, obviously, none of these big leaders knew that he was a mobster or skimming off the top. But in any event, a photo op was taken in which Junior allowed himself and other big names, and the reporters got a hold of it, and they're like, hey, that's a mobster there. There's something suspicious going on here. And pretty soon, it's a scandal. It even ends up on 60 Minutes. So you can imagine that Paul was enraged at this junior, and he was irritated at Senior by default for letting this punk get away with so much. And he took Nino's side and agreed, you can whack them. He didn't technically say that. He said you can deal with it how you want to, but that's basically saying you can whack him. He considered Junior a liability. And by default, he considered Senior a liability because Senior would do anything to take up for his son. His loyalties were to his son first. Senior was able to tell that Polly was upset with him, and he was chagrined that he had ever asked, terrified. Junior was also frightened for a change, his cockiness drained from his bones, especially when Nino and Roy rebuked any attempts to make up. They wouldn't even talk to the guy. Then Roy and Nino decided, all right, they'll meet with Senior, and they'll meet with his son Junior at a diner. Of course, the plan was to act nice, misleading them, so that they would go to Roy's little spider parlor, the Gemini Lounge, which, of course, means the clubhouse, uh, so they could whack and Houdini these two. Roy, in particular, wanted to Houdini these motherfuckers. Senior and Junior agreed to meet at the diner, but Senior had a plan. Senior had gotten close to his nephew, an overweight, sociopathic, and incredibly obnoxious cop named Louis Eppolito. Yes, the Louis Eppolito. The fat cop who went on to be the infamous mafia cop. And by now he was already very corrupt as well as had a reputation for abusing suspects. Now Senior asked Louis to be his bodyguard for him and his son when they met Roy and Nino. Sure, anything for his uncle. And Louis was already close to his equally corrupt and far more intelligent former partner, the slim and rat-looking Stephen Caracappa. Looks like a cartoon character they both do together. Caracappa was rising fast in the ranks of the NYPD, despite having a shady past that included a criminal record. So when Nino and Dominic and Roy arrived at the diner, they saw these two cops with Junior and Senior, so now there's four of them. And at least the two cops are armed, and who wants to shoot some cops? Nino and Roy probably acted indignant. Either way, they didn't agree to meet. It was called off. Senior was as nervous as ever, and over the next day, he contacted Nino and Roy. And Nino said basically he got over it. I don't know the specifics of the conversation, and agreed to meet for another sit-down. This time it was going to be at Roy's Gemini Lounge, though, which means the clubhouse. And they could straighten this out. And just as a matter of good faith, they'd have Pete Passante to help moderate and act as a diplomat. Passante was one of Senior's best friends. They loved each other like family. Now, Passante was this bald-looking, white-haired man who looked even older than Dracula, even though he wasn't as old as he looked. So this made Senior feel a little less anxious, though he was still very, very nervous, but he consented. 
Of course, Nino and Roy just didn't tell Basante they planned to murder his friend, and now Roy could dismember this pair and have Anthony Center's cousin, Volpus, bring a garbage truck over or loan them another garbage truck to feed them to Fountain Avenue. Roy was as cheerful as a starving baby who had just been fed his formula. He couldn't wait. That night, around 9 p.m., the group gathered in Junior's flashy, red-trimmed, white 1978 Ford Thunderbird sedan, with Junior at the wheel. Nino Gaggi settled in front, Roy is in back on the left, Senior's on the right, and Passante's between them. And, of course, Passante's looking around, oblivious to the carnage that was about to follow. They begin driving towards the Gemini Beach. Along the way, Senior notices suspicious, furtive looks from Roy. Horror washes over him like water. He's a dead man if he doesn't do something real quick. Senior, panicking and not thinking, decides to do the stupidest thing he could possibly do, and screams at his son, STOP! I HAVE TO RELIEVE MYSELF! Son laughs. Dad, you got to go again? Wait and I'll stop at a gas station. I said pull over! Listen to me, son! Senior cried. And of course, demanding to pull over in an isolated, dark area next to a high school is probably the worst thing Senior could have done, because the streets are bad, busy that night, at least in that area. But Junior obliviously zooms over and screeches to a halt. It was Shore Parkway in Brighton, 6th Street, and that's their opportunity. Nino twisted around and fires several shots into Junior's skull, blood and brain bursting everywhere. Roy reaches quickly past the terrified Passante and fires several rounds into Senior's jaw, ripping free everything below his grieving Louis would later say his uncle looked bucktooth from it. Roy leaped out and fled in one direction, and Nino, he fled in the other. And Roy, as he's leaping out, he's wiping his face because he's got blood all over him. Passante must have been really bloody since he was right in the middle of it. So, as they're running, Nino and Passante in the other direction... They slow down and start walking at a normal rate so that nobody notices they look as bloody as slasher villains. And as bad as everything went, it's about to get ridiculous. So along the way, this scrawny man named Patrick Penny, he's driving his girlfriend and her girlfriend friend past the Thunderbird when he spotted shattering glass and Roy Murch wiping his face with the handkerchief and Nino and Passante bloody running in a different direction. Now, Penny was usually not the kind of guy who would interfere. Penny was a two-timing junkie burglar who rarely acted respectfully, let alone heroic. But when Penny spotted all of what happened there, the murder, the shattering glass, well, he must have been feeling very unhappy about the kind of guy he was because that night before, he had a dream in which he was a hero who stopped a nefarious evil mastermind planned on destroying New York City. This must be a fucking sign. That dream was an omen. Who isn't going to let these degenerate lowlifes murder somebody? It's obvious they had just killed a girl. He was sure that they killed a girl. Weirdly enough, Roy and Nino were criminal masterminds, even if their victims were definitely not girls. Oh my god, oh my god, let's get out of here! His girlfriend and her friend screamed. They just saw a murder. They don't want anything to do with this. No, not this time. This superhero Penny decided he's got to stop this, and he hunches over the wheel and zooms toward a cab that's nearby. Hey, you got a radio on that thing? I just saw a woman murdered, Penny said. The cop, Sergeant Paul Rodar. What? Where'd you see this? I'm a cop. This is just a side job. And he was a tough cop, too. Get in the car now and show me where this happened. Uh, Penny just remembered he had a twenty two in his jacket, and he's a felon not supposed to have that, so he's like... No way! They're headed in that direction. I'll follow in my car. Of course, Rodar didn't have time to argue with them or even think about it, so he sped off, spotted Nino and Passante walking briskly past the gas station. Rodar quickly skirted diagonally and threw the door open as a cover and drew his gun. Please freeze! Nino and Passante, well, they had just passed the gas pumps, and they spin around. And Nino, he draws his thirty-eight and pops off three useless rounds that go nowhere. Rodar, in turn, fires back and shoots Nino in the neck, throwing him backwards. He spins and falls on the ground, his thirty-eight clattering next to his hand. Passante makes a useless gesture to try to stop Nino from falling and gets shot in the knee, Ugh! stumbling away and surrendering. Nino, though, spotted his gun. It was time to die like a man. His trembling hand reached toward the gun. Rodar shouts, Stop! Freeze! Don't do it! Nino sighed, huffed, dropped his hand, 
He was weak, and besides, this is suicide, not dying like a man. The pair were quickly arrested and driven to a nearby hospital in ambulances. Armed guards were placed at Nino and Pasante's door, and this too were identified. Roy, meanwhile, heard everything that happened, the ambulances, the cop cars coming. He wasn't going to fuck with cops. This would be stupid. He'd just get arrested. Couldn't help Nino now. Roy runs, tosses a gun in the drain, calls Freddy on the payphone. Freddy arrives, and they speed off. Dominic, well, he gets a call at the bunker and is horrified. His uncle's shot. Doesn't know if he's going to die or not. And Roy and Dominic, they meet after driving the hospital. Roy lies and says he's Nino's cousin to try to get in. But they wanted some ID for this dangerous patient. Unlike what Sammy Gravano said on his channel, no, they weren't going to let some mob greaser in past the guards do to do so that he could rip a bullet out of his neck in some kind of ridiculous surgery that makes no fucking sense. And the bullet was going to come out on its own. It was a... Uh, very, very weak shot. So later, Dominic and Roy met, probably at the bunker or over her phone, and Dominic is enraged and screaming, You left him in a bad spot again, you fucking coward! I had to! We had to split! It was Nino's idea! Roy said, Yeah, right! You're real fucking fearless, rooster! Roy winced. There was hurt in his eyes. He hated anybody suggesting he was a coward. He would kill anybody for that. Not Dominic, that was Nino's nephew. They contacted Paul, who heard what happened, and Nino's transferred to Rikers Island Hospital. Now, good luck getting them out of that. Roy, in desperation, at that moment, you would say any stupid thing that came to his mind to not feel like a coward and to get Nino out of this. Things were already horrible in his life. Crisis is everywhere. Roy says the most foolish thing that comes to his mind. I got an idea. We're going to get in there with scuba gear and sneak in with machine guns and then sneak Nino out. Dominic snaps back. That's the stupidest James Bond shit I've ever heard. Roy winces again, furrows his brow, and brainstorms. As soon as he got it together, of course. And then he has an idea. Not just any idea, but one of Roy's great ones. And it would work against all odds. But that's next episode. The opposition to the evil that Roy was unleashing across Brooklyn didn't just begin with McCabe, but with a tenacious and smart detective. Detective John Murphy, who had a buzz cut and lines branded across his face from middle age. He had a reputation as a religious man whose faith helped influence his sense of right and wrong. When he learned about the massive auto theft operation operating out of Canarsie, the name Patty Testa kept coming up. And initially, Murphy believed that it was Patty that was the ringleader of this. Then informants began speaking about his brother, Joey, who was really the guy in charge. Murphy didn't know about DeMeo, and he had no clue about the snowball of dark secrets. His investigation would begin. Roy built himself up to be the perfect father, unconditionally loving his children as best as he could. After his parents had failed him, if I could speak to Albert decades into the past, I would tell him, I'm worried about you, Albert. Sometimes questions are better not answered. You see, Albert saw his father's mask, but he knew something wasn't quite right. He knew his father had killed someone before, but he never knew just how much blood his father's history was steeped in. Who were you, Roy? And just how much damage will you do to those who loved you when they find out about your darkness underneath?
Thank you.